السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الوقت تم لساني يفقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما يا كريم إن شاء الله we're going to today start uh, سورة كهف last time we did an introduction and we talked uh, detailed about Dajjal and why it is necessary for us to connect with the surah uh, today we're going to start um, before any ilm or any science uh, is taught to individuals. Generally, the ulama, they have this, they call it muqaddimat al-ashr. They call it the 10 introductions that are necessary for a person to actually truly benefit whatever is being taught. Um, we're not going to go into all of those introductions, but some of those introductions are necessary. So, number one, what is that science? So what we're studying today, what is the science called? The science that we're studying today, or the, 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 the methodology that we're studying today, is the methodology of tadabbur. Okay? The word tadabbur, or to ponder upon something, is very different than tafsir. So tafsir is like it goes into the elaborate details. We want to look at what Ibn Abbas said, one, you know, one mujahid said, all of the previous salaf and all the opinions that exist about this ayah and we put them all together and then we try to figure out which one is, is more preferable, why, what is the reason. So there's an entire process to that. Tadabbur is more to do, to, actually the word tadabbur comes from dubur, which means something behind something behind of something. And tadabbur basically means that there is the obvious text that you and I see. But then there is an intended meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to walk away from this, which is not obvious, but it is implied through the ayah. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ do they not ponder upon the Qur'an? Am ala qulubin aqfaluha? Or is it that their hearts are locked up? Okay? So, the obvious meaning is, Allah is asking this question, why don't you ponder upon the Qur'an? Or do they not ponder the, upon the, the Qur'an? Or are your hearts locked up? That's the obvious meaning. What are some of the implied meanings we can get from here? Guys, this is going to be very practical. To, so you guys are going to have to work with me. Right? So I'm going to ask questions, and I, I like that everybody gets involved in this. What are some of the implied things we can understand? Okay, number one, our hearts can be locked up. That means if our hearts have the capacity to be able to lock up, there will be things that will unlock the heart. It's all there. But th that's when you ponder, oh, wait a minute, a heart can be locked up? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about a heart being locked up? What's, how, what is the feeling of somebody who doesn't have a locked heart? Then you go on this exploratory journey of looking at, okay, what are the, some of the other attributes? There are 134 attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran just for the hearts. 134 different aspects of the heart that Allah has mentioned. Today we're going to study, for example, Surah, uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, the, this beginning. The word Alhamdulillah, there are 63 ayat in the Qur'an that have the root word of Hamd. And in that, there are different elements of Hamd, praise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alluding to. So when we ponder upon this ayat that our hearts are locked up, oh, we get to know that the hearts are locked up. Number two, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a question. Who is the one who is asking the question? أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran? Do they not ponder upon the Qur'an? Who is the questioner? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When somebody of the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks a question, is that act important or not important? Very important. So that tells us this tadabbur is an important act. The third thing that we extrapolate, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ It's a collective, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the collective position over here. It's plural. يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Why do they not collectively ponder upon the Qur'an? That tells us that it is a communal obligation. So all of that is extrapolated through tadabbur without actually going into tafsir. 
Now what is the actual meaning of tadabbur? Tadabbur could mean 10 different meanings. There are 7 different aqal of that's tafsir. So we are not doing tafsir. We are doing tadabbur. Because that is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every Muslim should have access to tadabbur. He should be able to look at the text of the Qur'an and understand it. We're not trying to make any fiqh rulings. We're not trying to say what's halal and haram. We are not trying to do any of that. What we're trying to do is here's the text of the Qur'an. How can I understand this text of the Qur'an and apply it to my daily life with the obvious meanings and the implied meanings? Is that clear? Cool. Alhamdulillah. So, some of the introductions that I'm going to give today. So, the first introduction is for every surah, Nuzul, when was this surah revealed? By the ijma of the scholars, the surah is a Makki surah, except one or two ayat. Okay? Majority of the scholars of the opinion that it was revealed in Makkah. was revealed in Makkah. It has 110 ayat because there are some, uh, some surahs in which there is an ikhtilaf between the tafsir scholars. If it has 6 or 7 ayat, if it has 10 or 11 ayat. Because some of the stops were, because we have to understand this. These ayat didn't exist at the time of Rasulullah The entire Quran is one conversation. There is no wahid, itnain, talata, arba, one, two, three, four. These did not exist at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu So the way they would recite, the, the way for them, Quran would be, Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عواجا. We stop here. For them, ولم يجعل له عواجا قيما لينذر. Towards the end. أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كثين فيها. حسنًا ما كثين فيها أبدا. It was continuous. They would continue. But the Sahabas understood meanings of it, where to stop. Okay, so they, when wrote the Quran, they placed stops. Stop here. Stop here. You are not allowed to stop here because if you stop here, you will change the meaning of the ayah. So these ayat were put together by the Sahaba, and certain Sahaba said Surah Al-Fatiha. Bismillah is part of Surah Al-Fatiha. That's why if you pick up the Arabic Qurans, the ones printed in Medina, it says Bismillah rahman rahim and it says Wahid, one. But if you pick up the Qurans printed in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, all of these places, Bismillah rahman rahim and then Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is one. In that Quran, Alhamdulillah is number two, the second ayah. Right? So th- those are minor ikhtilafs. It doesn't change the meaning of the, uh, the Quran. The Quran is as is. So when we say that it has 110 ayat, which means that there is no difference within the scholars how many ayat it has. It has 1,579 words and 6,306 huruf, alphabets. Okay? 6,306 huruf, five, oh, 1,579 words and 110 ayat. This is the only name of the surah. There are surahs in the Quran which has sometimes six names, seven names. Naming, the naming convention of the surah is that either Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave us that name or the first three generations, they suggested a name for the surah. After the first three generation, today, Hassan can come and say, you know what, I don't like surah kahf name. I think, you know, it should not be called surah kahf. It should be called, you know, this surah should be called uh, surah Musa. Because it has the story of Musa or Surat Khadir. Right? You and I can't come and make that decision now. Okay? So the first three generations, so, so the ones that Prophet ﷺ told us that name is called Tawqifi, which means we stop at that. Tawqif means waqf to stop. We don't go beyond that. These are the names that came from directly from Prophet. ﷺ. Then there are other names that came from Sahaba. They didn't get it from Rasulullah, but they named that surah. And none of the Sahaba amongst them told them, don't name this surah this way. So Abu Bakr comes and names the surah, and Umar and Uthman and Ali, everyone's okay with that name. So then they're like, okay, this name is acceptable with the Sahabas. But again, it was not from Prophet ﷺ, it was ijtihadi, it was something that the Sahabas, it was their own conjecture, and they said, Let, it, there's no harm in naming it this way. 
But after that generation, the first three generations, you and I can't come and name the surahs. Okay? So it has one name. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fadl of the surah last time. For example, Prophet ﷺ said, whosoever memorizes the first ten surahs, and if you meet Dajjal, you can go and recite this on Dajjal, and it will be ismatum minhu. It will protect you from Dajjal. In another ayah, it says, it will, uh, the last ten ayahs, that will be a protection. In another hadith, it mentions, in another hadith, it mentions that whosoever memorizes kullaha, that who memorizes the entire surah, it it makes Jannah wajib on that person. Okay? In another hadith, it says in Musnad al Darimi, whosoever recites Surah Al Kahf, Laylatul Jum'ah, the night of Friday. What is the night of Friday? Thursday night. Okay? For us Muslims, it's Thursday night after Maghrib. Because our day begins from Maghrib. So Laylatul Jum'ah, so our night comes first and then the day comes. So Laylatul Jum'ah is the Thursday night for us, for our, our terminology. Whosoever recites after Maghrib, Laylatul Jum'ah, Adha'a lahu minan nuri, Allah is going to illuminate a specific light for you. Fima baynahu wa bayna baytil atiq. Between you, that intensity of that light is such that it will illuminate the path if there was absolute utter darkness. Wherever you are from here until Mecca, that entire path will be illuminated with that nur. Ajib. Im imagine the lumens on that light. <laughs> right? It's just crazy. Like you ca cannot even begin to understand. Okay? Then another hadith Prophet says, and Abdullah ibn Farwa yaqul anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal ala adullukum ala suratin shi'aha sab'oona alfa malak Shall I not tell you about a surah that when it was being revealed there was an entourage of 70,000 angels that came with it. Mala'a idhamuha ma bayna as-sama'i wal ard The greatness of this surah encompasses everything that is between this earth and heavens and the earth. Whatever, from here till the first sky, whatever exists in here. The greatness, the surah and its greatness is greater than whatever. It fills the entire universe. And basically, i.e. the entire universe is filled with the greatness of the surah. For whom... Sahabas, who's going to get this greatness? Litaliha, the one who recites it. If we don't recite it, you don't get, get the greatness of the surah. But if you become from those who recite this surah, Litaliha, if you recite this, you will be filled with that greatness too. Allahu Akbar. Qalu bala ya Rasulullah, tell us about this surah, that's such a great surah. Faqala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, surat ashabul kahf. The surah of Ashabul Kahf, the people of the Kahf. Man qara'aha yawmul jum'ah. Whosoever recites it on, the, on Friday. Ghufira lahu al ghafar allahu lahu al jum'ah al ukhra. From the past jum'ah till today, whatever sins you had done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has expiated all of that for you. Everything is gone. Waziyadat thalathat ayyam. So the previous seven days and add to that three more days. The three days of coming also you're forgiven. Bonus. You get extra bonus. nuran, And that person will be given nur, light. nuran, That person will be given light. Yablughu sama. The light would be so powerful and intense. That nur that person will be given, that if that nur, this light was to be pointed at the sky, يَبْلُغُ sama, it would reach the first heaven. That light. And then in the end he says, وَوُقِعَ مِنْ فِتْنَةِ الدَّجَّالِ And it will also protect you from the fitna of Dajjal. Okay? These are all that are considered hasan or you know, uh, uh, these hadiths all are sahih or hasan. There are other hadiths that are da'if in nature, but again, 
you know, we, ha we have enough for us to get from Sahih that we don't need to get into those. So we begin, inshallah, the surah today. Um, the sequence in how we're going to do this is I'm going to recite the verse. Or we're going to ask uh, somebody to recite the first seven verses. And then after the first seven verses, we will go through the surah. Very simple. Those of you that have taken tafsir classes with me, you know what I'm talking about. Right? We're going to go through word, 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 try to understand the text of the ayah, then try to understand the entire whole ayah and how it applies to us, and then maybe do some reflections on that together or some lessons towards the end, inshallah. Okay? Jameel. Um, Khizr is going to recite. Yes. Thank you. First seven ayahs. Let's go. Loud. Next time. Barakallah fiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he starts off Surah Al uh, Surah Al Kahf. Allah says Alhamdulillah Ladi All praise is to the one Anzala ala Abdihi al Kitab, the one who revealed on his Abd, on his servant Al Kitab, the book. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجَا And Allah has not created for it, i.e. for this kitab, عِوَجًا Any crookedness. Any crookedness. You can grab some chairs from there. There's some chairs. Oh, it's okay if you want to sit down. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this surah with Alhamdulillah. How many surahs in the Quran begin with Alhamdulillah? Five. 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 Which ones? Surah Al-Fatiha, somebody better get that. Because if you don't get that one, I'm, I'm walking out of here. I'm like, yeah, are you guys even Muslims? Right? So, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah that you got Alhamdulillah. That's great. What else? Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Anzala Ala Abdihi al Kitaba. Great. What else? We got Fatiha. Fatir. Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Fatir is Samawati Wal Ard. Okay. والأرض أنعام أنعام أو مايدة أنع أنعام next last one سبا سبا سورة سبا okay سورة سبا in every single one of these beginnings Allah سبحانه وتعالى this hamd this praise of Allah سبحانه وتعالى is bound to a specific attribute okay so the word hamd when Allah, when Allah is praising, when we're, we're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the first one is, Alhamdulillah, we were praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what? Rabbil Alameen. He is the creator of this universe. Okay? Over here, we are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that not only the fact that He created you and me physically, right? And the next ayah is, Khalaqa samawati wal ard in Surah Al An'am. Allah is the one who created 
the praise be to Allah, the one who created the heavens and the earth. So he created us, he's the creator, he created the heavens and the earth, but he didn't leave us like that. So the third surah comes and says, Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab, that he created you physically and he created the sources of your sustainability physically, but then he also created for you your spiritual sustenance. Anzala ala abdihi al-kitab, that he is the one who revealed on his abd, on his servant, the kitab. The word hamd in the Arabic language is interchangeable. So, shukr, hamd, and madh. All of them, we can use the word hamd to describe all these three. Hamd, praise. Madh, to praise. In English, all of them are same, but we're going to come to it now. And shukr, to thank someone. Okay. Number one, hamd, specifically, when, when you say hamd, in the meaning of shukr, thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is specific to an exclusive bounty that Allah has given you. And that bounty belongs to you and nobody else. Allah gave you three children, alhamdulillah. Those are your three children, nobody else has them. That's an exclusive bounty to you. Allah gave you a new car, a better job. Those are exclusive things. So when you say Alhamdulillah Allah for the job, you're thanking Him, you're use, using the word Hamd for the meaning of Shukr. Now, the second meaning is Madh. Okay. Oh, the second meaning is Hamd, to praise when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And this is the, the, the praising that we're going to talk about. When we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using the word Hamd, it is for a bounty that you have benefited from and 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 I have benefited from and all of us have benefited from. So when hamd is used in the meaning of praise, which is the meaning over here, alhamdulillahi alladhi, all praise to Allah, praise to Allah for, the, uh, for a specific bounty that was sent for you and for me and for every single one of us. We all are in... Debt of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to praise Him. Okay? And the last one is when He used the word hamd for madh. It's something that is beautiful and not necessarily that something has to provide any benefit to you. So you can look at a beautiful car and you say, you know, alhamdulillah, it's a great car. That car, alhamdulillah, is not providing any bounty to you. You are praising something. Whether that thing has provided any good towards you or not, you praise it and that comes, that hamd comes in the meaning of madh. Now all of this in the Arabic language, in the Quran, various different meanings of hamd have come and most of them sadly have been translated to praise, 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 praise in translations. But we you know, look at the context and then if the word hamd is being used for a bounty that is specific to you and me, for example, hidayah, guidance is specific to you, for example, you got guided. Right? So if it is hidayah that you want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that's your guidance. If Allah gave you a beautiful voice to recite the Quran, that is for you, not, not the person next to you, not the person next to you. But then when it comes to Quran, when it comes to our iman, when it comes to all of these things that everybody has benefit in, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the, the greatest bounty that we have in our ummah. Right? He's the greatest bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given. Right? وَلَقَدْ uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ The greatest bounty that Allah has sent to the believers is Allah resurrected a, a, a messenger from amongst you. Okay. So, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّ أُمَّتِي الْحَمَّادُونَ Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, My ummah, are the ones that have praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most. No other nation has praised Allah more than Muslim Ummah. Why is that? Remember I said... <laughs> okay. So we pray five times a day and we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen in that. Right? 17 times a day. Okay, after yes. After every salah, we say Alhamdulillah. Everything good, or bad, we always say, Salah. Everything good and bad that happens, we say Alhamdulillah. When you wear your new clothes, what do we say? Alhamdulillah, Kasani. 
He prays to the one who gave me this clothes to wear. Alhamdulillah alladhi at'amani. Or, you know, and if you look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the time he would get up disturbed in the middle of the night and that would be his waking up for tahajjud, what would he start off with? Right? As the hadith mentions, that he would, he would start off, Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. A lot of people don't know that that's when you wake up and you're happy. But when Rasulullah would wake up and he was disturbed, disturbed by some, something that happened in your life, some email that your boss sent you at 2 o'clock at night and you went to sleep dis, you know, disturbed, or somebody sent you a text message and ruined your entire day for the rest of the day. We all go through those things, right? When Rasul, and Rasulullah was also a human being, he would have those experiences too. Do you really think he went to sleep that night when Abbas wa Tawalla revealed he was like, mashallah, great ayah? He went to sleep. No, he was like disturbed. Like he said, I hurt a human being. So when he would wake up, wajaan, like he, he woke up out of a shock. He, would not, he was not settled. He woke up unsettled. Then he would say, Allahumma laka alhamd, anta nuru samawati wal ard. Oh Allah, all praise to you. You are the nur of the samawat, all the heavens and the earth. وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ أَن تَقَيُّمُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And all praise to you, you are the one who is, a sta- who is sustaining qayyum. He, you are sustaining the samawat and the earth. وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ أَن تَرَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And all praise to you, you are the Rabb, you are the creator. Rabb is somebody who takes someone from very, 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 very basic beginnings to perfection. Very basic beginnings to perfection. In a stage-wise progression. So stage-wise, you go from a baby. That's why somebody who takes care of you, your parents, when you grow old, they have done tarbiyah to you. The word tarbiyah comes from rabb. That they took care of you in every stage. You, now you needed food. Now you needed shelter. Now you needed, uh, you needed to learn how to tie your laces. And you needed to learn how to put your belt on. And put your hijab on. And all of tarbiya state-wise. So he's saying, Prophet ﷺ, وَلَكَ الْحَمْدُ أَنْتَ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So even in that night, Rasulullah praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he gets out. He prays salat. In his salah, he's praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he is finishing the salah, hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan. When you're getting up from the ruku' and imagine the value of the praise in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know the story of this, right? The story of the sahabi. This was not from Rasulullah. So, you know, as they were praying, one of the sahabis, he got up. And you know, he was feeling really spiritual. Like he was feeling like really connected in the salah. So he, out of his deep connection, he said... He uttered things that his heart wanted to praise Allah in a manner that Rasulullah had not taught him. So he said, Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi Mil'u samawati wal ard. This, you know. So he said this. What happened after? Rasulullah says, Manil ladhi qala hadha. Who said this statement? So now this guy is like, I'm, okay, I'm not even speaking up. Because uh, he, Rasulullah is going to take me to town, right? I'm not going to say anything. Because it doesn't look like it's a positive thing. Then he says, Man qala? Who is the one who said this? Qala thalath. In one narration says, he asked three times. The, the person was so scared to say. Then finally he said, Anna ya Rasulullah. Like I was the one, you know. Um, he says, I saw 70 angels. So Rasulullah was able to see. So Tadabbur allows you to see that. He was able to see angels. He said, I saw 70 angels that were present in the gathering. And they all ran towards this one person to be able to document this praise and be the first ones to take it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I wrote this. Uh, this is a new praise that nobody has praised Allah before. And I was the one that documented it. Yeah, Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani, he was a scholar of the last century. He passed away, um, I think in the 70s or 60s. Um, Sheikh Yusuf al Nabhani, he was from Palestine, right? So, what he said is one day he said, you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off Surah Al Fatiha 
with Alhamd. So it is so important for me to understand this concept of Hamd. The concept of Hamd. So for the next five years, he didn't have Google. He didn't have AI. <laughs> Chat GPT, tell me all the praises, <laughs> hadith that exist. Right? So he sat through reading every single text that he could. Every single... Uh, so he started with the Qur'an. So he documented every place in the Qur'an where Allah was praised, you know, by Hamd or Thana. And he found that they were close to one-sixth of the Qur'an was all praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he moved on to hadith, hadith collections. Today, we have roughly 67,000 unique hadith in our collections. 67,000. If you take Bukhari, Muslim, all the Siha Sitta, and also the other six other books combined, remove all the repetitions, we have around 63,000, 67,000, some people say 67, right, roughly 70,000, right? He found, he collected close to 10,000 hadith. In the introduction of the book, he says, that وَلَقَدْ جَمَّعْتُ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ عَشْرَةَ أَلْفَ حَدِيثًا I have collected more than 10,000 hadith, unique hadith that just pray, that are all about praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said, and I have removed from them da'if. If I was to add da'if in it, then I would probably spend my entire the rest of the life trying to figure something out. Then he said, how am I going to compile all of this together? And, um, you know, uh, then people could not be, you know, he put everything together. I think it was close to seven or eight volumes. And he was like, there's no way people are going to read this. So he concised it and he brought it down to, I think I used to have that book. I, I lost it in, in the shipment when I was coming from Saudi back to Canada. Uh, but the book was called uh, Al Jami'u Thana Al Allah. Al Jami'u Thana Al Allah. I believe it's available in English too. Somebody has translated it from UK. Uh, Yusuf al Nabhani, uh, Jami'u Thana Al Allah. And that book is around 180 pages, I think, 160 pages, 170 pages. It can't be more than that. But it has, it, it, for me, that was one of the easiest, but one of the early reads that I read when I was in Saudi. And it allowed me to actually really appreciate the concept of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because this is a very powerful concept in our religion. It, it, it is supposed to provide iman boost to our iman by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's supposed to have an, 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 a direct connection to our iman. Okay? <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off and He says, Alhamdulillah. The word al over here, this al in the Arabic language can come for multiple meanings. Al, for example, if I say, um, if you guys leave from here, right? We were all sitting here. And then I talk about, and we're, we're like somewhere by the lobby over there in the entrance. And I say, you know the TV, which TV are, would I would be referring to? Which would be the last TV you saw? These two TVs, right? So this is called Lamul Ahd, the last thing your mind can recall. So when I say the TV, it's the last thing. When I say, the, so we were all sitting and the Ferrari drove by or Lamborghini drove by. And an hour later, I'm like, you remember the Ferrari? We, it's not here, but it's the Ferrari or the car, the specific item that you saw that went. Okay, that's Lamul Ahad. The other Lam is called Lamul Istighraq, which means that the terminology that my Sheikh explained it, he said, if you were to take this word and the concept of Hamd, and if you were to take the word Hamd, and if you were to take that and drown it in water. Istighraq means to drown, which means when you put Alif Lam, it means that every single type of praise that happens in this world, all of that, the chain of that, all of that goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, you did something nice to the brother next to you. He says, Alhamdulillah. How is that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who placed in your heart to actually do something good towards your brother. Without Allah's tawfiq, that would not have happened. And that tawfiq, you praised him for the, the amal, 
but it was actually the tawfiq of Allah that allowed you to benefit from it. So the, the ulama, they say, وَلَوْ تَسَلْسَلْتَ الْحَمْدَ If you were to create a chain of hamd and all the praises that exist in the world, you will find that every single type of praise returns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And this is lam of istighraq. Alhamdu, every single type of praise that can exist in the world, all of that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You like a beautiful car? The car would not have existed if Allah had not placed iron in the earth. Nothing that you would praise except that you will be able to make a link back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. He is the one who revealed on his servant, abdihi, on his servant, al-kitab. When Allah uses the word anzala, it's different than nazzala. Anzala means the entirety of the book was revealed to the first heaven. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Did the Quran reveal entirety in Laylatul Qadr? No. Where did it get revealed? To the first sky, Sama ad dunya. It came from Lawh al Mahfuz until the first heaven. From there, it came down over 23 years on Prophet. When that this, you know, you know when, when that 23 years of revelation is talked about in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word nazzala. But when he uses the word anzala, the mufassirun, they say it's always referring to al-kitab. Because the book didn't exist. Quran did not exist in the form of a book at that time in Makkah. So it is referring to the kitab that was there. Anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba. Allah is the one who has revealed on his abd, the kitab, the word abd is the highest maqam, the highest status that a person can achieve in his life, which is an absolute submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nobody has perfected that status more than Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As a matter of fact, the ulu, the ulama, they say the, the, the height a person may rise with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly correlated to the depths of submission that he can portray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why if you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it's, it's, it's very befitting, right? Because it's the same Allah, right? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Ta'if, and he was going through that difficulty, and the kids had thrown stone at him, and the blood had flown, so you need to understand how much blood was flowing because if blood flows a little bit, it dries up. The blood flowed enough that it went down his clothes all the way down to his leg until his leather socks became wet with the blood. So it was not just like a minor, oh, I, you know, I got hurt and there was a small bleeding and it stopped. It was enough blood. Like, so he had enough wounds on him that he bled to the level that he fainted. Then when he woke up, he found himself in the garden. And he sat next to the garden and somebody saw him. And this was one of the Jewish people who used to believe in Yunus ibn Matta. He was from the tribe of Yunus ibn Matta. And he was a servant and a slave. He comes to him and he says, Min aina ant, where are you from? So the person says, I am from, you know, Nainawa. I'm from Nainawa. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Min baldat Yunus ibn Matta. You're from the land of Prophet Yunus. So this person is like, the Arabs don't know anything about Prophet Yunus. Like, how do you know about that? He said, Huwa akhi. He's my brother. He is a prophet and I'm a prophet. This, the parallel in this beautiful thing is, right after this, the story of Yunus alayhi salam is that for him to rise to his ascension, he had to go to the depths of the sea. The whale had to eat him and go all the way to the depths of the sea. And he ascended in his ranks in, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by being tested to go all the way to the depths of the sea. Right? And then make the dua. Inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. Right? Then he, he came out because of this dua. For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in that moment... Allah is capable of rising somebody by taking him to the lowest depths of the sea or by like Rasulullah in the lowest moments of his life, 
Right after that, Allah took him to the highest maqam that a human being can ever raise. And both were anbiya. But the difference was the ulama, they say that Rasulullah had perfected ubudiyah. He had perfected servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Total submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu anha, once some of the sahabas, they came to Prophet and uh, to, to, uh, some of the sahabas, they came and they sat down with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uh, sorry, they sat down with Aisha radiallahu anha. And, you know, this was when she had become old. And they asked her, tell us about how was Rasulullah? This, this was a generation who had not seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they wanted to hear firsthand from his wife, كَيْفَ كَانَ حَيَاتُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wasallam. How was his life? So the Sahabas, they responded, so Aisha radiallahu anha, she responded, he said, Laylatan min layali, one of the nights, dakhala alayya Rasulullah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he entered. Faqama fatawadda, he got up and he made wudu. Fasalla. So he, he started praying. Faqama fasamad. He got up and he became like a statue. Wabaka, and he kept crying. Wabaka, he kept crying until the tears flow down from his beard and his chest. It became wet from his tears. Summa raka wa samad. Then he did ruku and he became a statue in the ruku. Long ruku. Then long sajda. Then after all of the salah happened, Ad Bilal radiallahu an came. And said, Fajr time has happened. So this is like he enters the home. And now he's in the two rak'ahs that he's praying. And he prays those two rak'ahs the entire night until Fajr time happens. So Aisha radiallahu anha says, Ya Rasulullah, Limada hadha? Like why doing this? Like if I was, she's saying, if I was in your shoes, لَقَدْ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ جَمِيعَ ذُنُوبَ Allah has forgiven everything. You're entering Jannah. Like I... If I got that, like, I'm good. So he turns back and he says, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shall I not be a slave of Allah that is thankful? This was the pinnacle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's servitude. That allowed him to be, سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي أَسْرَى بِعَبْدِهِ لَيْلًا مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ الْأَقْصَى الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهِ Sanctified is the one that took Abdihi, his servant, from Bayt al-Maqdis all the way to the seventh heaven. And that same ubudiyah made him qualified for him to be able to receive this message, Al-Kitab. The reason we need to emphasize on this is today, many times, our, we see people around us, right? You say something about the deen and they're like, yeah, chodo, yeah. Well, please forget about this. And we can talk about deen later. Or like, you know, as we were hearing something today, he's like, you know, hajj. Hajj? What do you mean? You, do, you, do you see white hair in my beard? Like, why do you want me to talk about hajj right now? Let me get old, inshallah, I'll enjoy my life. Then when I get older, I'll think about hajj. Right? Ubudiya is when you become capable of that ibadah, you submit to Allah and I say, yes, I will submit and I will do it. Irrespective of what is happening inside in, around our society. And it's very hard because when an ayah comes and hits us wrong, a brother came to me and he said, Shaykh, I work for this company, Fortune 500, I'm a director level, uh, you know, and I have to buy alcohol on my credit card. That's part of the things we have to do. I said, I, I really doubt that the policy says you must buy alcohol. I don't think any company has a policy that says you must buy alcohol for your client. I think it's just the norm. And you are really afraid of not following that, breaking that norm. Or it's an implied understanding. But if you say that my religion, because the, in which country are you going to be able to say my religion does not allow me to buy alcohol for somebody? This is the country, freedom of religion. Where else are you going to practice this? You say, I'm not going to buy this. I know of an individual who runs a company, mashallah, he's you know, very, very well to do. And in his company, he has like more than 120 staff here in Atlanta. And 
he has a policy, he has everybody working, non-Muslim, Muslims, he has a policy, you cannot expense alcohol and you cannot expense pork. You can't take your client on a bacon breakfast. And, and it's weird because some of these, these white people have to go and say, I'm sorry, you know, I can't put bacon on my credit card, company policy. But that's amazing. But that shows you ubudiyah, that we submit to the command irrespective of the circumstances we're in. And when we do that, wallahi, thumma wallahi, Allah is only going to increase us in status. Because when we submit it to Allah's will and Allah's command, knowing that there might be consequences, know that Allah is not going to leave you alone. مَنْ تَرَكَ شَيْئًا لِلَّهِ عَوَّدَ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا مِّنْهَا If you left something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know the promise. Allah is going to replace it with something that is going to be better. خَيْرًا مِّنْهَا It is going to be better than what you left. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here, he talks about this beauty of Allah Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his attribute of abd. Anzala ala abdihi al-kitab, al-kitab, this book. It is referring to the book Quran. In it is halal and haram. In this book is what tells us what is right and wrong, what we should and should not do, what is the stories of the, the people of the past. And the entire Quran is filled with the, the two predominant type of narratives. It is either talking about revelation and nations that carried the revelation. So it is talking about Bani Israel, it is talking about the people of the past, it is talking about Saba, it is talking about all the people that had a revelation or they interacted with Anbiya and how they behaved. And the second thing is it is here to tell you what to do and what not to do in your life. Okay, That is what Al-Kitab is. The sad reality is many of us Right? We'll spend our entirety of life not knowing what Allah has asked us in this kitab. So alhamdulillah, this is at least a step in the right direction. For this particular kitab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah has not... See the translations, I don't know what, if somebody has a translation, but you know, generally the translation is like it doesn't have crookedness, there is no crookedness allowed in it. Those, those are metaphoric meanings. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ جَعَلُ الشَّيْءِ To create something means لَيْسَ أَوْ مَا كَانَ مَوْجُودًا فِي مَا قَبْلْ It did not exist before. So when Allah is saying وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجًا There has not been any crookedness that was created for it. So it is far from having any crookedness in us. Allah is like there was never any form of crookedness that was ever created that could be applied to this Qur'an. Then what is the quality? Qayyiman, the next ayah. Qayyiman, it is absolutely perfect, decisive, it is absolutely straight in its meanings, in the decisions that it tells us, in the do's and don'ts. If you look at today, what happened with the, today's, you know, we're in this political climate, right? Left, right, pro-choice, and all of that abortion, right? How did that all happen, right? Summary of it was, in the United Nations, they said, okay, we want the best experts. We're going to take experts, they're going to talk about the children, and the, 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 the life, and how life is pro-life or pro-choice, right? Life is important. They're like, no, no, we got to look at the choice of the woman. And the two presented their arguments, and today we have the two camps that you see. One says absolute life, irrespective of the consequences, and the other says absolute choice, irrespective of the consequences. Both, when they connect, that connection where they cannot agree is iwaj. It's crookedness. And if you look at the position of our deen, it is very different. It takes into consideration both sides. It's actually the only position that can satiate both sides. The position of Islam. That's not the point here, but like, you know, right? we're not going to go into that. But the point being, awaj, crookedness. So we may hold positions, society may hold positions, left, right, go this way, go that way. Islam comes and says, this is the position. Now, whether you like it or you don't, this position is qayyim. It is absolutely perfect and straight. Okay? 
The other part, the other meaning of the word ivaj, this is important because I didn't, I didn't explain the word ivaj. I'll, I'll go back to that word just quickly. So the word ivaj, if it starts with a, a kasra or a zair, iwaj, and there's another one which is awaj with a fatha, there is a subtle difference in that. If it's awaj, it is referring to a crookedness in a physical object that your eyes can see. So, for example, something like if you look at that chair, it is t twisted. You can, your eye can object to that chair that is crooked. It's actually bent. Your eye can tell that. That type of crookedness that is physical in its nature and it is visible through the eye is called awaj. Okay. When the crookedness is in our beliefs, when the crookedness is in our beliefs, it is metaphysical crookedness. It's not physical in its nature. It's crookedness in our thought, aql, our intellect. Those crookedness are referred to as iwaj in the Arabic language. And the third category of the word iwaj is crookedness that cannot, if you use the word iwaj with a, with a kasra or a zair, it also refers to crookedness that is not apparently visible to the eye. So it could mean a spiritual or a metaphysical or a belief or a mor moral crookedness. And it could also believe it is crooked, but by the time you figure out it is crooked, it's too late. Which is referring to marketing propaganda. Cool. Okay. How are we doing with energy? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. No, I'm not talking about your Alhamdulillah energy. I'm talking about some. How are we doing? Is a, we're good with energy, everyone? Good? Okay. You're tired? Down? Okay, we don't care. You're my son. It's okay. Your energy can. You can sleep if you want. You can go there and sleep. Qayyim, and I'll stop at this ayah. Now, by the way, so this is, I had to spend time explaining some of the concepts. We're not going to be going this slow. You know, people know me that have done that. There are some key concepts that I need to get across. So maybe first two sessions are going to be slower and then we pick up pace. Okay? Uh, because there are very important concepts related to the surah that I'm trying to set the stage so that when we come across those things, then it's going to be easier for us, inshallah. Okay? Qayyim, it is absolutely straight. Perfect. لِيُنْذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا Now what is, okay, this is great. This book has no crookedness in it or no crookedness has been created for it and it is absolutely perfect and straight. The first thing you would expect if Allah has described a book with these qualities is Allah is going to talk about like, you know, do this or don't do that. The first thing Allah says is, this book has come so that it may warn لِيُنْذِرَ It may warn Ba'san shadida. It may warn people about a severe torment. Question, what is the torment? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the torment to us? Why is the torment not mentioned in... Why Allah has not mentioned the torment to us? Why not talk about the torment? Huh? No, but why not say that there's going to be Ba'san Shadeed, it's going to be a severe torment and then the torment is you will be thrown into hellfire, this is going to happen, your legs are going to get roast, whatever. Like, why not specify the? This is called pondering, asking questions. Why not specify? Okay, so let me, let me give you a, yeah. No, no. So, for example, if I say to you, let's say we'll take anybody, Ali, for example. So we say that, you know, you have misbehaved, you haven't, but just example. You know, you have misbehaved in the class and Hassan is going to punish you after. Are you going to be worried? Hassan, you're like, okay, whatever. Right, punish me all you want. Right, like punish me all you want. But then, if you switch that and you say, you know what, 
you have misbehaved and you've crossed certain rules and now you're going to be taken to the sheriff's office and they'll, they'll be taking care of you. You have a little bit more concern, you're like, wait a minute. Now, if those sheriffs happens to be in Egypt, then you have a little bit more concern, right? Because there is no qawani and there is no rule. If they happen to be in Pakistan, may Allah protect you, right? Like there is no end after that, right? Khalas, we don't even know where you went. We'll, find out, we'll hopefully find out about you in two years, right? As the severity of the punisher increases, the, the, the judgment of the punishment intensifies. So look at the ayah right after that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is a severe torment. All you need to know, Milla dunhu. The torment is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the punisher. The punishment, you don't need to worry about what the punishment is. It is enough of a punishment for you to know that the punisher is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where are you going to run? Aina tadhabun. Fa aina tadhabun. Where are you going to go? Allah's like, Fa aina tadhabun. Where are you going to run? <laughs> you can't run anywhere from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Qayyiman, it is straight. Liyunthira, so it warns people. Ba'san shadida, it warns people about a severe torment. Min ladunhu, this torment is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that should be enough to shake us. But then it also, the Quran is also filled with وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And give glad tidings to the believers. Yubashira, yes. The word who is from, to Allah, from Him. The damir of who? Beautiful question. Now we're going to get into grammars. It's okay. It's fine. I like that. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillahi alladhi anzala Alhamdulillah Allah anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. So who is the one anzala? Allah prays to Allah. The one anzala. He is, Allah is the one. And that same who comes over here, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيُنذِرَ بَأْسٍ شَدِيدًا مِنْ لَدُنْهُ From this punishment is from the same Alhamdulillah, Allah, the one Allah that we talked about. It's this who is referring to that Allah. Okay? And, and the general rule is that the dhameer or the pronoun, it goes to the first possible aqrab madhkur, which means when you go back, what could possibly this pronoun refer to? You go back to ayah before ayah before ayah before word before you keep going back. The first noun that you come across, generally that is what it is referring to. Sometimes it may not. Sometimes it may not. Okay. But good, that's a good point. From him. And give glad tidings to the believers. Okay. Bushra or glad tidings is something, so the word Bushra comes from Bashar, right? What is this called? Arabic, Arabic, Bashara, Bashara, okay? You, haven't you seen any Arab ads of like those beautiful creams and stuff like that? It's been so long. <laughs> you know that, those ads that come, hey, revive your Bashara in skin, and like you know that, Bashara, Bashara, they keep talking about it. So it is talking about Bashara. Zahirul jild. It's not the, the apparent skin, not what is inside. Okay, what is wadah. So generally, bushra is a glad tiding, a news that you receive from someone, and it's a good news. And when you receive it, the effect of this news is visible on your actual skin. So when you hear, when you get a promotion, it's visible on your skin. Everybody in the office can see you. Like, what happened, bro? What's going on? They can figure that out. They don't even know the news, but they can figure it out. When somebody gets the news of a newborn baby and they get a newborn baby, that person comes to the masjid, you can see them before the mitai. Right? You can see the... You, before even they give you the sweets, you can actually see the, the, the glad tiding on his skin. So, bushra is a glad tiding that when a person hears it, in this world, the effect of that glad tiding is going to be evident on our skins. Okay? 
And that is why the ulama, they say that, uh, you know, Ibn al-Qayyim, he used to say that, uh, actually, it's not Ibn al-Qayyim, I can't remember who said it, but one of the scholars, he used to say that this is one of the reasons when somebody recites Qur'an, يَظْهَرُ عَلَىٰ بَشَرَتِهِ عَلَامَةُ الْقِرَاءَةِ this because of this, because Qur'an is filled with those glad, glad tidings. So when a person is reciting Qur'an, he's going to recite about Jannah. He's going to recite about how Allah is going to treat him in Jannah. What is going to be the rewards that he's going to get in Jannah. So if you are constantly daily reciting the Qur'an, the effect of that good news is going to be on your skin. Because it's going to impact your inside and you're going to be happy. You're going to be like, subhanAllah, Allah has promised me great things, man. It's coming. But as a person who does not recite that Qur'an, then that effect is not going to be there on his face. Okay? الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And Allah says this glad tiding is for believers. الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ It is not enough for us to say, I am a Muslim, I don't need to practice Islam. This glad tiding is for mu'mineen, but then Allah specifies, what is this definition of a believer? الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ they are the ones that are in a continuous effort. They don't have to be perfect. Sometimes we assume perfection as iman. No, no. They have to be in a constant state of striving to practice. There's a huge difference in that. Ya'maluna means what? That they are constantly, you know, one thing after the other. It's a continuous, constant effort of theirs. Ya'maluna salihat. And they're focused on what? Salihat, which is pious deeds. For them, anna lahum ajran hasana. Allah is like, for them, Allah is going to have a very fine reward. Ajran hasana. Now, imagine, who is the one providing the ajr here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Where Allah says the punishment is from Him, over here Allah says, anna lahum ajran hasana. Allah is going to give you not just any ajr you're going to have, a, a, you know, hasan has, or something that is hasan, it actually means you didn't deserve that reward. Ihsan, when we say somebody does things with ihsan, it means that you were supposed to move the mic one inch. You moved it two inches to make it easy for the next person. Right? So ihsan is to do something فوق المطلوب, to do something beyond what is re required from you. So over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you're going to get ajr, you're going to be rewarded for your salihat, but that reward Allah is going to multiply it and it's going to be hasana, it's going to be beyond what you actually actually fathomed, beyond what you conceived of and what you deserved. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the punishment of hellfire and save us from... Uh, Zalal. The next ayah will end over here, inshallah. Ma kifina fihi abada. You're going to stay in this, i.e., in this state, whether it is punishment or whether it is the reward. Allah is like, Ma kifina fihi abada. When we are in that world, it's eternity. Anybody that knows a little bit of math, they know that anything over infinity is what? Zero. Anything over infinity is zero. The life in Jannah, the life in Jahannam, life in Akhirah is infinite. It is. So whatever we have done in this world, right, on that day, compared to the Akhirah, infinity, it's zero. It's going to be of no value. Zero. Now, what is the biggest fear you and I have in this dunya when Allah gives us a bounty? The biggest fear you have and I, you and I have is that either that bounty will remain and you will leave this earth. Right? It, the bounty, the gift, the, the enjoyment that Allah has given you, that enjoyment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying what? Like what is going to happen, the reality of this dunya is you're going to have this and your fear is, man, this may break and I may outlive it. Or this may outlive me, i.e. it will remain and I will leave. So when Allah says, مَا كِثِينَ فِيهِ abada," He puts to rest that your ajran hasana, all the effort that you had done as a believer, all the things that we have done as a believer, all of those ajr, 
is going to be hasana, but remember, it's not temporary. In dunya, I gave you ajr, I gave you rewards, you, you benefited. Right? In the, when you read the Quran, you got the glad tidings, you were happy with it. But then, akhirah ma'kithina fihi abada, you have no fear of ever, ever, ever being turned away from the bounty of ajr and hasana of this akhirah. And also fear very, very fearfully that لِيُنْذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدٌ There is a severe torment مِنْ لَدُنْهُ from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that too, if you do things willfully against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you can become also worthy of مَا كِثِينَ فِيهِ أَبَدًا May Allah protect us from that end, inshaAllah. We'll stop over here. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to practice and to implement, inshaAllah.